Welcome to Lesson 2, Part 3, Budgeting for Independent Living, Apartments. First, we're going to take a look at rent and how this impacts your apartment search. What do you think the average one-bedroom rent in Manhattan or Brooklyn is right now? These maps show the average cost of a one-bedroom apartment in Manhattan and Brooklyn. In the Harlem area, you're looking at $21 to $2,200 a month. In Bushwick, $2,250, and in Bed-Stuy, about $2,200. The farther out to Brooklyn you go, or the farther north into the Bronx you go, it does get cheaper. However, there are very few places where you can find a one-bedroom apartment for less than $1,400 or $1,500 a month. When talking about monthly budgeting, the number 30% often gets thrown around as the ratio of your rent or housing expenses to your monthly income. However, this ratio is not realistic, especially in cities like New York where housing is very expensive. In reality, this 30% ratio really only holds true in Staten Island. In every other borough, residents are paying more like 50 to 60% of their monthly income in rent. When apartment searching, it's important to find a balance between what you really, really want and what may be realistic. Knowing that New York City has one of the most expensive rental markets in the country, there are a few different factors that you can consider. In terms of location or neighborhood, farther out in the outer boroughs or Staten Island or even New Jersey tends to be cheaper than Manhattan or the areas of outer boroughs closer to Manhattan. Transportation is another factor. Apartments that are close to express subway stations or lots of bus stops tend to be more expensive. However, it can make commuting easier. If you want to live farther out, you may want to consider access to a bike or a car. Another factor to consider is how your work schedule impacts how easily you can use public transportation. Buses and trains run less frequently overnight, so it may be more helpful to have a bike or car in that scenario, or you may want to live closer to multiple options. The third factor is amenities in your building. The more amenities like dishwashers or washer dryer that are in your building or in your unit may increase the cost. Aside from reconsidering the amenities and location of your apartment, there are a few other ways that you might be able to help afford the apartment that you want. One idea is to look for a second or part-time job or to see if you can get more hours at your current job. Sometimes people also try to reduce their spending in other areas. One of the most common ways to reduce the rent is to share the space and get a roommate. This can be a great way to save money on rent, but there are some really important considerations to think about with this. So let's talk about those. If you are going to move in with roommates, think really carefully about who you are choosing to live with as the stability of your living situation will be dependent on this other person or other people. We cannot stress this enough. Each year, we have trainees and program graduates return to shelter because of roommate situations. Sometimes they lose housing because a roommate stops paying rent. Other people move in with a significant other and lose housing when that relationship turns sour. Some of these things are unpreventable but often there were red flags or discussions that could have helped. Before you move in with someone, be sure to discuss and document the financial expectations, who was responsible for paying what. Talk about each of your own abilities to manage your joint and financial responsibilities, and talk about the process that you'll use to address unexpected or new expenses. Also think about what is your relationship history with this person? How long have you known them? How well do you know them? Do you have an on-again, off-again relationship, or does it tend to be more stable and consistent? Just like rent is expensive, so is moving. In addition to your first month's rent, some places may require last month's rent and or a security deposit. You may also have to pay an application fee as well as a background or credit check. Depending on the amount of stuff you have, you may have to pay for moving costs, if you don't have a lot of stuff, you may be able to save there, but you may need to pay for furniture to get your apartment started. 
Now is the time to think about and start to plan for this. What might be covered by a voucher or a subsidy? What will you need to pay for? What should you start saving for now? If you're using a subsidy or voucher not just for moving expenses, but also to cover rent for your first few months or year in the apartment, make sure you think about, will you be able to pay the rent when that voucher or subsidy expires? If not, how do you plan to cover the difference in what you're used to paying? And what can you do now to plan ahead to prepare for that increase in rent? Once you've signed a lease for an apartment or a room, renter's insurance is the next thing to consider. Many renters think that their landlord's insurance policies will cover their belongings, but that's not usually true. Your landlord's policy covers the building itself, but likely won't cover your personal belongings or any injuries sustained within your unit. This is why it can be important to get renter's insurance. Renter's insurance protects your personal property in a rented apartment, condo, or home from circumstances such as theft, a fire, or sewer backup damage. And the policy will pay for lost or damaged possessions in these instances. It can also help protect you from liability if someone gets injured in your unit and sues. Some management companies even require you to get a renter's insurance policy upon moving in. There are a number of factors that the insurance company will take a look at when setting a price for you. A few of these are out of your control. They'll look at the city, state, and neighborhood you live in. And they'll dig a little bit deeper into your specific location. They'll look at the surrounding area to assess risk. They might consider things like the crime rate or how close you are to a fire station. They'll also look at the building you live in. Older buildings may lead to higher insurance rates because they may be more likely to have plumbing or electrical issues. However, you can often lower the rate a little bit by making sure that things like smoke detectors and fire extinguishers are installed. The other considerations are controlled by you. You'll have some options in how much property you want to insure, your personal property coverage. Another factor is how much liability coverage you want. That will be used if someone gets injured on your property. And the third factor is how high your deductible is. The deductible is the amount of a covered loss or liability that you pay out of pocket before the insurance company helps cover costs. For example, if a fire causes $1,500 in insured damage to your personal property and your deductible is $500, you'll pay that first $500 and then your insurer will pay you the remaining $1,000. A higher deductible often leads to lower insurance rates. Taking all those factors into consideration, what are we looking at here? Most renters insurance costs just about $10 a month or a little bit over $100 a year. Rent and utilities aren't the only budgetary concerns you'll have once you secure a job and move out. You may also elect to pay for health insurance, medical, dental, or vision. You may want to contribute to a retirement fund or put money towards a life insurance policy. Your employer may offer flex spending, which allow you to take money out pre-tax for health, transit, and child care. If you have children, you may need to continue to pay child support, pay for child care, or contribute to their other needs, such as clothing, diapers, and school supplies. If you have debt, you may need to budget some money to pay towards your credit card debt or student loans. And of course, you'll need to eat and there will be other household expenses. Even if you're moving back in with family, you may be expected to contribute to the household in some ways that we haven't talked about as well. However, there are many free tools available to help you create and stick to a budget. There are lots of free phone apps and tools and templates using spreadsheets and other documents. For more information on some of these options, reach out to your financial management instructor. To get credit for completing this lesson, please return to the Google Classroom classwork page and submit the Lesson 2 Part 3 Assessment, Budgeting for Independent Living Apartments, Google Form.